Hallelujah. Uh, I can see why God told the Israelites to send out the choir in front of the army to gain victory. And I believe, and I believe that's why uh, we have the choral anthem before we begin the service and the praise before the service. And I believe that through the praises that all the darkness, all of the forces of Satan are already destroyed. Amen? And in today's passage, it is about the holy day that the Israelites observed after completing the city wall construction. And this holy day, uh, just as you have read, uh, may we not grieve and may we rejoice in the Lord. Amen? It sounds like you want to grieve. May you grieve, should I say. (laughs) This is one of the most uh, delightful, uh, uplifting passages that we have read in in this story of reconstruction. And finally... The temple is uh, completed, the city wall is completed, and the priests and the Levites are saying, don't worry anymore, don't grieve anymore, stop weeping, but let us rejoice. And I believe that is the day that we are looking forward to, and that is the day that we practice every Lord's Day. We come and we lift up all our worries and concerns to the Lord, and I believe that God says, don't worry Stop weeping. You don't have to grieve anymore. Let us rejoice. Amen. 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 So, this is on the Feast of the Trumpets, because the last verse in Nehemiah chapter 7, we read in, verse, uh, in chapter 8, but in chapter 7, the last verse, okay, Verse 73, it says, When the seventh month came, the sons of Israel Israel were in their cities. So when the seventh month came, because the f- completion of the reconstruction of the city wall was on the 25th day of the month of Elul, which is the sixth month. And after completing, the seventh month came. Same week. And then... He, uh, today's passage came, saying they have, they have gathered to celebrate. And I'm going to explain that later. But this foreshadows the eternal Sabbath that we are going to enter into as we enter into the New Jerusalem. As we spiritually finish the reconstruction of the temple and the city wall in our lives, in our, in our faith. So I sincerely pray that you and I, Zion Church, will be able to complete our spiritual temple and the city wall so that we may enter into this joyful day. Amen? And so what we have, I'm going to do some review. What we have come to understand through Zerubbabel's temple and the consecrated genealogies of the returnees is the reason why we need to rebuild the temple and the city wall. The reason why this part of the redemptive history, the part where the Israelites return from Babylon, rebuild the temple of Zerubbabel, and rebuild the city and the city wall. Why is that important to us today? Zerubbabel's temple was the last temple in the Old Testament. It's a type of the last temple that you and I will enter into. That you and I who have come out of Babylon, will need to re-establish. And that, that temple, that city, is called the New Jerusalem. Also, the city and the temple were rebuilt by the chosen people of God, a.k.a., also known as the remnants in the Bible. It is the, in the history of building the Zerubbabel's temple, it, were, it was the people who came out of Babylon, who came back to Jerusalem, very few in number, those who participated in reconstruction of the temple and the city. 
And Zerubbabel Temple was the temple where the Messiah was supposed to come. Not only the the glory, the glory of God or the Spirit of God, the Messiah was supposed to come to this temple spiritually and physically. And I believe that the temple that you and I are building up together, that will be the temple where our Lord will return. And we pray spiritually and physically. And what is that temple? It's you and me. We are the temple of the Lord, right? We are establishing the walls around us, whereas try to build up the temple. Revelation chapter 18, verses 3 and 4, speak about the great harlot in the spiritual Babylon in Revelation, in the end time. It says, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, the great harlot, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Speaking about this world that we are living in right now. Verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. And that is the voice that we are hearing from the Word of God today. Come out of her. Come out of the life of sin. Come out of the the ways of the world. And so let us think about what is the result of rebuilding the temple and the city wall. That is the title for today's message. What is the result of rebuilding the city, the, the temple and the city wall? First, let us think about the reason for rebuilding the temple and the city wall. Why do we need to do this? What's the significance? In the center of redemptive history is the fulfillment and redemption of the Garden of Eden. This whole history of redemption began when Adam and Eve sinned against God and rejected God's Word and His Spirit in the garden, and they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Their spiritual communication with God was severed, cut off, right? And from that point on, God made the promise, I will send the seed of the woman. He will restore everything to you. And that is the history of redemption. And therefore, our purpose spiritually is to return to the Garden of Eden, which signifies spiritual temple where we can communicate with God, we can walk with God, live with God. We are called priests in that temple. Adam was. And so that is the central core of redemptive history and purpose. And so let us think about how it all happened. Briefly, God formed the garden in the east, in Eden, in Eden. And that garden is called the Garden of Eden. The garden in Hebrew is Gan, which means fenced area, fenced garden. That means it's protected, it's distinguished from the outside world. It is set apart. It is a, a, a blessed place designated and distinguished by God. And we know by now that word designated, distinguished, consecrated means holy. It's a holy place. And then God breathed into the nostrils of man that was formed from the dust of the ground. He became a living being and God put that man in this garden and gave him task. As a result of being able to fulfill that task, as a result of that land, garden, and man that God created with his spirit in him, this combination created what is called Sabbath, rest, peace. What about those two tasks? 
Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, we know this, right? Then the Lord took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to, to do two things. To cultivate it and keep it. So was Adam a farmer? Did God need a farmer to take care of the garden, backyard garden or Mesopotamian garden? Is that what it was? But this word cultivate, we know, and the word keep, these two words are very important for us to understand. First, cultivate is abad in Hebrew, which means to work, perform, serve, worship, and carry out. Carry out meaning fulfill. There is a purpose. There is something to fulfill here. It is a worship term. Liturgical term. It is not a farming term. And then to keep shamar in Hebrew, it means to watch, to guard, and to revere. Okay? Uh, for example, for example, in the concept of time, person, or thing. Okay? Let us think about a thing that you consider very precious. A million dollar diamond that is in your drawer back home. Yeah? You all have that, right? No? You don't? Yeah. You can think of anything that you consider very precious. What do you do to make sure that is kept safe? Or a person like your child, your loved ones. Or time. What, what part of your day is most precious to you that you make sure you protect it? Nobody touches it. It's your time of zenning or zoning. <laughs> you know, we try to protect it. Make sure nobody touches it. So we put that in safe, lock it up. And that's what it means to keep. And when God says, you shall keep the Sabbath day holy, that word keep, the Sabbath day, that is shamar. It is to observe. It is to revere. The Bible, there are many, uh, several Bible passages where these two words appear together. But we're going to look at one, one as an example. It's in Numbers chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. It's a description of the task and duties of the Levitical priests in the tabernacle. So, I'll read it for you. They shall perform, shamar, the duties for him and for the whole congregation, congregation before the tent of meeting to do the service, abad, of the tabernacle. They shall also keep shamar, all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, along with the duties of the sons of Israel to do the service, abad, of the tabernacle. This is the work of the priest serving God, worshiping, and keeping in the tabernacle. Adam's duty in the Garden of Eden was to not just to farm, but to serve and worship God and to maintain and keep in order what God has created. In the Garden Temple, just as the priests and Levites were to do in the Temple and Tabernacle, the tasks given to us today, I believe, is the same in the church. Make sure all, everything about worship service goes well, according to God's will and to the glory of God. And to make sure the orders of people and things, holy things, you are in this church, you are holy people. Amen? All these things in the church, they are holy items holy things to make sure that they are in order to make sure that they are glorifying God also this task given 
to both Adam in the Garden of Eden and to the priests in the tabernacle and temple and to you and me in the church. There's one common thing. There's a purpose. And that purpose, the, the product that comes out, the result that comes out as a result of Abad and Shamar is Sabbath, rest. And I've shared about the concept, the Semitic, Hebrew, Hebrew speaking people's understanding of what Shabbat and Noach was. Shabbat was the action, the, the process. It's not just take a rest because you're physically tired. Because God was not physically tired after the six days of creation. That's not the reason why God rested on the seventh day. It's the concept of the king, good, benevolent king, sitting on the throne after, after conquering or, or, or uh, protecting the nation, making sure the enemies are all outside of the border, which is fortified. The borders are fortified and protected. And under this king's reign, everything is peaceful. Under this king's reign, all of the people are enjoying, just as we read in today's passage. They, can, they don't have to grieve. They can enjoy, go drink, and, and eat in the Lord. And that is the true Sabbath. And when that, that process of king reigning with his sovereignty, God reigning with his sovereignty, and people under his word and his, with his spirit are enjoying, that, that whole environment, that whole process results in nuach. And the word, the name that we know of, Noah in the English pronunciation is Noah. Noah. What God did after the flood, destroying sin and the powers of sin, and God made His renewed, and that is Noah. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 10, Joshua chapter 1, verse 13. Chapter 21, verse 44. Second Samuel, chapter 7, verse 1. First Kings, chapter 5, verse 4. I'll read Deuteronomy 12, 10. It says, When you cross the Jordan and live in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and He gives you rest from all your enemies around you, so that you live in security. This rest is Noach. God will protect you from all the enemies. And in order to do that, see, this is in Deuteronomy. After God brings the people into the land, the promised land. Okay? Restoration of the land, like the Garden of Eden. Restoration of God's people, taken out from Egypt, retrained and, and trained in faith and the covenant, brought into the land. And then God says, I will push out all the enemies. The wall protection. Once this happens, God says, all you need to do is to abad and shamar. Keep my commandments. Keep the Sabbath. Then you will live in this rest, in this peace. And I believe that this applies to you and me today. Ask yourself, you don't have to answer me. Is your heart in peace today? Think about the past week. You, we, don't, we cannot remember that far, right? Uh, too far. So just think about this past week that you have lived. The warfares that you have gone through. The concerns and sadness and tears. But God says, you come into my, my sanctuary. Come into my land. I will protect you. Do you think you can, we can trust in God? And say amen. This Sabbath is not only, this state of Sabbath is not only when, you're, when you don't have any work to do. 
when you're resting at home. It's not only, it doesn't only apply on Sundays when you're in church. But this concept applies even during warfare. Let's say you and I are soldiers fighting in a war. Can you feel and experience Shabbat during a battle? Do you think? I think you're all warriors fighting in this world against Satan for the name of Jesus Christ, right? Can we feel that Shabbat out in the world? Can we feel that Shabbat from Monday through Friday? Is it possible? It is. It is possible for soldiers to feel Shabbat in their hearts if they are sure that they are following the right commander-in-chief. If they are following the right leader and you're right behind, fighting behind the great leader who will bring us victory. You might be fighting, but your heart is trusting. Your heart is in faith. And so even when we are fighting in this world, fighting against our own sins, I pray that you and I will experience that Shabbat, that God is with us, that our Lord Jesus Christ already has victory and he's leading us in this fight. Amen? So the restoration of the temple is the restoration of Abad. Restoration of the city wall is the restoration of Shamar in the Garden of Eden. So now, who's going to do this? Who's doing the work of re- rebuilding? The important thing is, you know, two things, Abad and Shamar needs to be done. But who's going to do it? In the Garden of Eden, God put Adam in the garden and told him to do it. In this context of history, when they were rebuilding Zerubbabel's temple, it it was the Israelites, the Jews, who came out of Babylon and returned to Jerusalem. I sincerely pray that you and I may be the ones, like Isaiah, saying, Here am I, Lord. Use me. May I be the builder of that temple and the city wall. And it is those who will enter into the new Jerusalem. What God fulfilled through the three returns from Babylon, okay, there were three deportations and three different returns. First, second, third return. Okay, here we go. What years were those returns? First return. I know you know it. You're just being shy and nice, giving other people a chance. You don't want to show off. I know. First return. BC or AD? (laughs) In the hundreds? Two hundreds? Three, four, five? Five hundred? Come on. I was going to finish this sermon earlier than, than usual. 537 BC? That sounds about right. right. First return. Second return. Why do you keep your heads down when I ask questions? Second return. Five, in the 500s or 400s? Four. 458. Thank you. And the third return. This one I know you know. Third return, 444 BC. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, let's come back. Through these three returns, what God has restored are the temple, rebuilt the temple, worship at the temple, meaning there were worshipers who are restored. God's focus, God's main focus is not Just the temple and the city wall. God's main focus is restoration of His people, of the Adam. God's focus, God's interest is in you. 
Not just the church building, not just the city walls, not just your business. His interest is in you. And that's why this book in the History of Redemption series, 11th book in the second volume, the title and the, the, more than half the, the entire book is about the consecrated genealogies of the returnees. God cares for those who return. That's the whole purpose of redemptive history. God wants his people to return. And God makes sure to keep them in order. Just like the book of life, he makes sure to remember the names. And those who participated in the temple construction are those who were fervent in doing God's work faithfully. They, they, they were priests who became good examples by leading. And there were those who participated through material needs, supplies, and different talents that they had. These are the people who made the work of rebuilding possible. More importantly, these were the very few that came back from Babylon. Second Kings tells us that most of the Israelites were taken, the southern kingdom of Israel, the Jews, Judeans, were taken to Babylon in captivity. Not very many, very few remained and they were dispersed and they, some people went to Samaria and so on. Most of the, the entire nation was taken to Babylon. But out of all the entire nation, how many people returned? How many people returned? In the first return, 49,897 people returned. 49,897. For an entire nation, it's not that many. Very small portion. Even for a small nation of Singapore, how many percent is that? 50,000 or 49,000, 50,000 people. How many percent is that? Is that like 1%? Huh? It, say, considering the whole nation has about 5 million people. Right? Is it? I, my, my math doesn't work really well. Second return. Only 1,775 returned. Third return, one person returned, Nehemiah. So altogether, 51,673 people returned. What about the rest? What about the rest? Oh, I have my business here, already settled. My, my kids are, are in school. Cannot go right now because my kids are taking PSLE this year. Yeah. Valid reasons and excuses. Our livelihood is here. We uh, already third generation settled down in Babylon. What about our work? We go back. Who's going to feed us? Where's the welfare over there? Nothing. Nothing is promised. Nothing is guaranteed. So is it those who did not have a good time in Babylon that returned to Jerusalem? No. Is it the homeless in Babylon that had to return to Jerusalem? I don't think so. Who are these people who returned? Very few. Who are these people? These are the people that remember the covenant of God. God said, after 70 years, you will return. These are the people who considered the building of God's temple more important than their own homes and businesses and children. I'm not saying they're not important, but their priority was different. They believed unless the temple stands, unless Jerusalem is restored, we are insignificant. There is no reason, no, no meaning for us to live our lives, even if we are very rich and well-to-do in Babylon. What is your priority today? 
What is our priority? It is not easy as it seems to be part of those who come out of Babylon. Because Babylon provides a lot of things. When you're living in Babylon, there's protection, there's security, there's good finance, you know, economy going around there. But in Jerusalem, there's no guarantee, there's no promise, outwardly. And they might have said, oh, yeah, yeah, but not now, but when we're ready, we'll come and move over there. After the first return, they started to rebuild the temple. And then the third return, from the first return to the third return, there were 93 years. Because the temple, uh, the wall construction was finished in 444, which was the year of the third return. How many people do you think participated in the city wall construction then, 93 years later. Now, it's not the same people, same generation that came back in the first return that participated in the city wall, obviously, right? I mean, 93 years later, who's going to do it? Your children or grandchildren will have to do it. So, what's the, what's the proportion, do you think? How many people, how many families actually participated in the city wall construction? Do you think that would be easy? Kind of like you are participating in the church construction today. What are the chances that your children and your children's children will also participate in the church construction 93 years later? What would require for that to happen? Passing down that covenant faith. The importance, showing your children the importance of living a temple-centered, Jerusalem-centered life. Letting them know they are chosen people of God. Letting them know that their priority in life is to build up the kingdom of God. I, I really sincerely pray that Zion Church will be able to do that to our, pass that kind of faith down to our children. And that not only pass them down, but show them. And so that they also can pass it down to their children. That's 100% assurance there. Just as Adam passed down that faith to, all the way down to Lamech. But even when Adam was dead already... Lamech was able to pass down the faith to Noah. Among the, uh, this is, I think, I don't, I have not ever seen in any other commentaries or, or uh, other scholars' works, this kind of organization, detailed organization of the genealogies of the returnees. Because I know, I myself confess, even today, to be honest, I look, read through all these, these names in Nehemiah and Ezra. It makes no sense to me. And, to, and many, I know many other scholars, they just you know, look at it as a genealogy and then go on to the next point. But Reverend Abraham Park, the author of History of the Series, he organized this, he compared the Nehemiah genealogy and Ezra genealogy of the returnees and then he organized them into three categories. Okay? The first category is according to the family line. 17 families returned. The second category is, is according to the regional, where they were living. Regional, 17 families. And then the third category is according to the temple duties. 17 families. So now... Among these two categories, first two categories, out of the 17 families, you know, descendants of somebody, descendant of somebody, basically 17 surnames, family names kind of thing, 
Okay? Se out of the 17 families, according to the family lineage, and 17 families according to the regional, the first, among the first 17, only two families participated in the city wall construction. From the second category, among the families according to the region, only four families participated in the city wall. So out of the 34 families, only six families participated in the city wall construction. What's the percentage there? Out of the 34 families, only six families were successful in passing down that faith to the children so that they can participate. They can take it as the task given by God for them to rebuild the, temp the, the city wall. It shows us that it is difficult to transmit, to pass down our faith to the next generation. It is a, it is a great blessing if two generations are in the same church worshiping together. It's a great blessing if we have three generations worshiping God together. And I, I, even if you don't have your children here, let us pray here together that our children will have that faith, receive that covenant, become the people of God that will establish the new Jerusalem in this end time. Amen? Who is to do this work? Those who came out of Babylon and those who transmit, pass down, hold firm the covenant and the will of God even after coming to Babylon. Not losing focus of the purpose that God has given us in our life. And that's why our second generation ministry, Elijah, young adults, Timothy Youth, Gabriel Sunday School. These people are very, very precious to us. Let us pray that we will not lose them. Let us pray that they will grow up to be the leaders of the church and of the nation. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 17, verse 6. Yet gleanings will be left in it, like the shaking of an olive tree, Two or three olives on the topmost bough, four or five on the branches of a fruitful tree, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. He says, in the end, people who will remain attached to the tree, people who will remain attached to the tree of life, who is Jesus Christ, is like this. After shaking the tree, all the olives fall off. Only two or three at the top, only four or five on the branches remaining. That's how difficult it is for people to remain to the end. Romans chapter 11 verse 5 also tells us, In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to, the, according to God's gracious choice. May we also be the remnants who will recover Abad through the building of the temple which is you and me. And also recover Shamar through the rebuilding of the city wall. And we learned last week about the city wall. Who builds the city wall for us? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, chapter 6, verse 19, we, our bodies, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the wall, city walls are built for us through the Holy Spirit. So as conclusion, the result of rebuilding the temple and the city wall is eternal Sabbath for you and me. I think we read it last week, so I'm not going to read it, read all the verses, but Ezra chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, is a letter, a petition, written by the enemies of the Jews when they were building the city wall, these enemies were writing a petition to King Artaxerxes of Persia saying, you should do anything or everything you can to stop this work. The enemies don't want the city walls to be built. Why? They said, because 
Once the city wall is built, we cannot exercise our influence on them. Once the city wall is built, they will not cooperate with us. Hear this as the voice of Satan saying, Satan doesn't want this spiritual walls to be rebuilt again. Satan doesn't want that broken fence of the Garden of Eden to be repaired because he wants free access in and out. The serpent wants to come into our life again. And Satan wants us to pay tribute to him, continue to pay tribute to him, periodically come back to him and commit sin again and again and again. He knows once the city wall, the spiritual wall is set up and repaired, he cannot do that to us anymore. Satan doesn't. Satan is going to do anything and everything he can to interfere with this wall construction. So what do we do? We do everything and anything we can to rebuild the wall. Amen? It's the contest of who will last to the end. And who will succeed? Satan, once the wall is set up, Satan cannot interfere with our life anymore. That's the true Sabbath. Once the spiritual wall is set up, Satan cannot come close anymore. And therefore, death will stay away also. And that's what Revelation 21 is telling us. The New Jerusalem had high walls. Coming back to our main passage today, the reason why they were celebrating is because the year when they finished the construction, 444 BC, was a Sabbath year. After the rebuilding of the temple and the city wall, finally they can enjoy the Sabbath year. Remember why they were sent away from the land? Because they did not keep the Sabbath years. But finally they come back and they finish the wall construction and finally they're back to observing the Sabbath year. And that Sabbath year begins with the seventh month. They finish the work on the 25th day of the sixth month. And on the beginning of the seventh month, as we read today, they gathered. And that first day of Tishri is the Feast of the Trumpets. They blow the trumpets to announce and proclaim to the world, the new year has begun. New world has come. The day of the trumpets. At the blowing of the, the last trumpet, the Lord will come and provide a lavish banquet of aged wine and marrows. Isaiah 25, verse 6 and the following. And this history first, the Feast of the Trumpet, is called High Sabbath. You know what High Sabbath is? There were seven High Sabbaths in the year. This, what High Sabbath is, it doesn't matter which day of the week, but when this feast day such as the Feast of the Trumpet falls, that day is a Sabbath. You keep that as a Sabbath. You also keep Saturdays, the seventh day, as a Sabbath. But this day, God says, keep it as a Sabbath. That's called High Sabbath. And so the first of Tishri is High Sabbath. They keep it as Sabbath day. So after the construction is finished, they were able to enjoy Sabbath. Do you want that Sabbath? Nowadays, I get tired and I say, I wish I had a whole day to just take a nap. The truth and the fact is, somehow I cannot do that even, even when I have time. And I realize, for some reason, our bodies cannot rest completely when our minds are not at rest. Our minds cannot rest when our spirit is not in the rest, in, in Sabbath. So even after sleeping, you wake up in the morning tired. We're supposed to wake up in the morning refreshed. 
See, if you still feel refreshed when you wake up in the morning, give thanks to God. There are people who wake up in the morning and still not refreshed. Right? But I believe when God gives us that Shabbat rest, our spirit, soul, and body will be refreshed. May we not only wait for that eternal Sabbath in the end, but may we start enjoying that Sabbath today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us and promising us that eternal Sabbath, restoration of all things, redemption of your people. Father, may we become the remnants of the end time. May we be able to say, Lord, here I am. Use me for your purpose, for your kingdom. May the purpose of our lives be establishing and constructing and entering into the new Jerusalem. And Father, we sincerely pray that your blessing of Shabbat will be upon your people of Zion. And Father, in, even in the midst of work, even in the midst of sickness and troubles and hardships, may we be in line in the order of Melchizedek, our Lord and King of Shalom, our King of peace and righteousness, so that we don't have to worry. We are going through the difficulties, but we believe that we are following our Lord who gained victory, our High Priest, our eternal High Priest, who will grant us eternal life. So Father, help us to believe that and go out and gain victory throughout this week. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us give thanks to God. Amen.